Chapter Seven of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. It was past noon. He had climbed high toward the saddle of the pass. Kushat lay small below him, and he could see now the pattern of the gorges, cut ages deep in the living rock that carried the spring torrents of the watershed around the mighty ledge on which the city was built. The pass itself was channeled, but only by its own snows and melting ice. It was too high for a watercourse. Nevertheless, Stark thought, a man might find it hard to stay alive if he were caught there by the thaw. He had seen nothing of Balin. The gods knew how many hours start he had. Stark imagined him, scrambling wide-eyed over the rocks, driven by the same madness that had sent Thanis up into the castle to call down destruction on Kiara's head. The sun was brilliant, but without warmth. Stark shivered, and the icy wind blew strong. The cliffs hung over him, vast and sheer and crushing, and the narrow mouth of the pass was before him. He could go no farther. He would turn back now. But he did not. He began to walk forward into the gates of death. The light was dim and strange at the bottom of that cleft. Little veils of mist crept and clung between the ice and the rock, thickened, became more dense as he went farther and farther into the pass. He could not see, and the wind spoke with many tongues, piping in the crevices of the cliffs. The steps of the earthman slowed and faltered. He had known fear in his life before, but now he was carrying the burden of two men's terrors, Ban Krushak's and his own. He stopped, enveloped in the clinging mist. He tried to reason with himself that Ban Krushak's fears had died a million years ago, that Otar had come this way and lived, and Balin had come also. But the thin veneer of civilization sloughed away and left him with the naked bones of truth. His nostrils twitched to the smell of evil, the subtle, unclean taint that only a beast, or one as close to it as he, can sense and know. Every nerve was a point of pain, raw with apprehension, an overpowering recognition of danger, hidden somewhere, mocking at him, made his very body change, draw in upon itself and flatten forward, so that when at last he went on again, he was more like a four-footed thing than a man walking upright. Infinitely wary, silent, moving surely over the ice and the tumbled rock, he followed Balin. He had ceased to think. He was going now on sheer instinct. The path led on and on. It grew darker, and in the dim, uncanny twilight there were looming shapes that menaced him, and ghostly wings that brushed him, and a terrible stillness that was not broken by the eerie voices of the wind. Rock and mist and ice, nothing that moved or lived, and yet the sense of danger deepened, and when he paused the beating of his heart was like thunder in his ears. Once far away he thought he heard the echoes of a man's voice crying, but he had no sight of Balin. The pass began to drop, and the twilight deepened into a kind of sickly night. On and down, more slowly now, crouching, slinking, heavily oppressed, tempted to snarl at boulders and tear at wraiths of fog, he had no idea of the miles he had traveled. But the ice was thicker now, the cold intense. The rock walls broke off sharply, the mist thinned, the pallid darkness lifted to a clear twilight. He came to the end of the gates of death. Stark stopped. Ahead of him, almost blocking the end of the pass, something dark and high and massive loomed in the thinning mists. 
It was a great carn, and upon it sat a figure facing outward from the gates of death, as though it kept watch over whatever country lay beyond. The figure of a man in antique Martian armor. After a moment Stark crept toward the carn. He was still almost all savage, torn between fear and fascination. He was forced to scramble over the lower rocks of the corn itself. Quite suddenly he felt a hard shock and a flashing sensation of warmth that was somehow inside his own flesh and not in any tempering of the frozen air. He gave a startled leap forward and whirled, looking up into the face of the male figure with the confused idea that it had reached down and struck him. It had not moved, of course. And Stark knew, with no need of anyone to tell him, that he looked into the face of Ban Krushak. It was a face made for battles and for ruling, the bony ridges harsh and strong, the hollows under them worn deep with years. Those eyes, dark shadows under the rusty helm, had dreamed high dreams, and neither age nor death had conquered them. And even in death, Ban Krushak was not unarmed. Clad as for battle in his ancient mail, he held upright between his hands a mighty sword. The pommel was a ball of crystal large as a man's fist that held within it a spark of intense brilliance. The little blinding flame throbbed with its own force, and the sword blade blazed with a white, cruel radiance. Ban Krushak, dead but frozen to eternal changelessness by the bitter cold, sitting here upon his corn for a million years, and warding forever the inner end of the gates of death, as his ancient city of Kushat warded the outer. Stark took two cautious steps closer to Ban Krushak, and felt again the shock and the flaring heat in his blood. He recoiled, satisfied. The strange force in the blazing sword made an invisible barrier across the mouth of the pass, protected Ban Krushak himself. A barrier of short waves, he thought, of the type used in deep therapy, having no heat in themselves, but increasing the heat in body cells by increasing their vibration. But these waves were stronger than any he had known before. A barrier, a wall of force, closing the inner end of the gates of death. A barrier that was not designed against man. Stark shivered. He turned from the somber, brooding form of Ban Krushak, and his eyes followed the gaze of the dead king out beyond the corn. He looked across this forbidden land within the gates of death. At his back was the mountain barrier, before him, a handful of miles to the north, the terminus of the polar cap rose like a cliff of bluish crystal, soaring up to touch the early stars. Locked in between those two titanic walls was a great valley of ice. White and glimmering that valley was, and very still and very beautiful. The ice shaped gracefully into curving domes and hollows, and in the center of it, stood a dark tower of stone, a cyclopean bulk that Stark knew must go down an unguessable distance to its base on the bedrock. It was like the tower in which Kamar had died, but this one was not a broken ruin. It loomed with alien arrogance, and within its bulk pallid lights flickered eerily, and it was crowned by a cloud of shimmering darkness. It was like the tower of his dread vision, the tower that he had seen not as Eric John Stark, but as Ban Krushak. Stark's gaze dropped slowly from the evil tower to the curving ice of the valley, and the fear within him grew beyond all bounds. He had seen that, too, in his vision, the glimmering ice, the domes and hollows of it, he had looked down through it at the city that lay beneath, and he had seen those who came and went in the buried streets. 
Stark hunkered down. For a long while he did not stir. He did not want to go out there. He did not want to go out from the grim, warning figure of Ban Krushak with his blazing sword into that silent valley. He was afraid. Afraid of what he might see if he went there and looked down through the ice. Afraid of the final dread fulfillment of his vision. But he had come after Balin, and Balin must be out there somewhere. He did not want to go, but he was himself, and he must. He went, going very softly, out toward the Tower of Stone, and there was no sound in all that land. The last of the twilight had faded. The ice gleamed faintly luminous under the stars, and there was light beneath it, a soft radiance that filled all the valley with the glow of a buried moon. Stark tried to keep his eyes upon the tower. He did not wish to look down at what lay under his stealthy feet. Inevitably, he looked. The temples and the palaces glittering in the ice. Level upon level, going down. Wells of soft light spanned with soaring bridges, slender spires rising, an endless variation of streets and crystal walls exquisitely patterned above and below and overlapping, so that it was like looking down through a thousand giant snowflakes. A metropolis of gossamer and frost, fragile and lovely as a dream, locked in the clear, pure vault of the ice. Stark saw the people of the city, passing along the bright streets, their outlines blurred by the icy vault as things are half obscured by water, the creatures of vision vaguely shining, infinitely evil. He shut his eyes and waited until the shock and the dizziness left him. Then he set his gaze resolutely on the tower and crept on over the glassy sky that covered those buried streets. Silence. Even the wind was hushed. He had gone perhaps half the distance when the cry rang out. It burst upon the valley with a shocking violence. Stark! Stark! The ice rang with it. Curving ridges picked up his name and flung it back and forth with eerie crystal voices. And the voices fled out whispering, Stark! Stark! until it seemed that the very mountains spoke. Stark whirled about. In the pallid gloom between the ice and the stars, there was light enough to see the corn behind him, and the dim figure atop it with the shining sword. Light enough to see Kiara, and the dark knot of riders who had followed her through the gates of death. She cried his name again. Come back! Come back! The ice of the valley answered mockingly, Come back! Come back! And Stark was gripped with a terror that held him motionless. She should not have called him. She should not have made a sound in that deathly place. A man's hoarse scream rose above the flying echoes. The riders turned and fled suddenly, the squealing, hissing beasts crowding each other, floundering wildly on the rocks of the corn, stampeding back into the pass. Kiara was left alone. Stark saw her fight the rearing beast she rode, and then flung herself out of the saddle and let it go. She came toward him, running, clad all in her black armor, the great axe swinging high. "'Behind you, Stark!' O oh, gods of Mars! He turned then and saw them, coming out from the Tower of Stone, the pale, shining creatures that move so swiftly across the ice, so fleet and swift, that no man living could outrun them. He shouted to Kiara to turn back. He drew his sword, and over his shoulder he cursed her in a black fury, because he could hear her mailed feet coming on behind him. The gliding creatures, sleek and slender, reed-like, bending, delicate as wraiths, 
their bodies shaped from northern rainbows of amethyst and rose, if they should touch Kiara, if their loathsome hands should touch her. Stark let out one raging cat-like scream and rushed them. The opalescent bodies slipped away beyond his reach. The creatures watched him. They had no faces, but they watched. They were eyeless, but not blind, earless, but not without hearing. The inquisitive tendrils that formed their sensory organs stirred and shifted like the petals of ungodly flowers, and the color of them was the white frost fire that dances on the snow. Go back, Kiara! But she would not go, and he knew that they would not have let her. She reached him, and they set their backs together. The shining ones ringed them round, many feet away across the ice, and watched the long sword and the great hungry axe. And there was something in the lithesome swaying of their bodies that suggested laughter. "'You fool!' said Stark. "'You bloody fool!' "'And you?' answered Kiara. "'Oh, yes, I know about Balin. "'That mad girl screaming in the palace, she told me, "'and you were seen from the wall, climbing to the gates of death. "'I tried to catch you. Why?' "'She did not answer that. "'They won't fight us, Stark. "'Do you think we could make it back to the corn? "'No, but we can try.' "'Guarding each other's backs,' They began to walk toward Ban Krushak and the pass. If they could once reach the barrier, they would be safe. Stark knew now what Ban Krushak's wall of force was built against, and he began to guess the riddle of the gates of death. The Shining Ones glided with them, out of reach. They did not try to bar the way. They formed a circle around the man and woman, moving with them and around them at the same time, an endless weaving chain of many bodies shining with soft jewel tones of color. They drew closer and closer to the corn, to the brooding figure of Ban Krushak and his sword. It crossed Stark's mind that the creatures were playing with him and Kiara, yet they had no weapons. Almost he began to hope. From the tower, where the shimmering cloud of darkness clung, came a black crescent of force that swept across the ice field like a sickle and gathered the two humans in. Stark felt a shock of numbing cold that turned his nerves to ice. His sword dropped from his hand, and he heard Kiara's axe go down. His body was without strength, without feeling, dead. He fell, and the Shining Ones glided in toward him. End of chapter 7